Matthew chapter 4. Continuation of the narrative given to us in chapter 3 where Jesus is revealed and baptized. Chapter 4 begins, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. We're going to break chapter 4 down into some sections because there's definitely um, different purposes of the sections that we have in what we call chapter 4. So this is really the, um, the completion of the story that started in chapter 3. You'll notice that the next sentence in verse 12 says now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison that's an indication that some time has passed okay so let's finish up the first part of chapter 4 here when you heard what God said to you what did you think was interesting or strange what stood out to you and Tyler for you and Elizabeth you guys are welcome to speak or be quiet whichever you want to do but uh, you'll find this is be a little different than the places you've been before. In the first part of chapter 4, you're saying it was strange? Yeah, so the part of chapter 4 that we read, what was interesting to you or strange to you that we just read? The paragraph that says, man shall not live by God alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yeah, that's a great... Uh, recall of the word of God. So why is that interesting or strange to you? <clears throat> Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Why is that interesting or strange to you? It's very interesting. It, to me, it, it, it says that um, food is over here, but it's the spirit within you and how you abide by Christ. That's important. Yeah, and the word of God is spoken of in this context as being somewhat important, not important at all, or of supreme importance. Every, every single word. Yeah. Right. So he doesn't say man shall not live by bread at all. Right. So he's not eliminating food. Right? He's acknowledging the reality of the way he's created us and that we do have to eat to refuel unless he intervenes. But more important than our food is the Word of God, according to this passage. It seems, in an interesting way, it seems like a strange response to what the devil said. All he said was, to the Son of God, make some food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why not? We need food. Even Jesus is acknowledging, not live by bread alone, means he doesn't need bread. It seems to me a, a somewhat strange state response. Yeah. How many people would think that it would be 
a problem if he would have turned the stones into bread and had them to eat. Certainly in our culture, it would seem that, that we would think that, well, what's the big deal? I just had something to eat. I guess possibly in the context of the fact that he's trusting in his own ability instead of the trusting in the provision of the Lord. Trusting the Heavenly Father The answer is found in sentence number one. He was led into the wilderness be tempted. to be tempted by the devil. So when the devil speaks to you to do anything, why would you follow him no matter what it is? Exactly. Consider the source to start with. Is there anything that the devil is going to encourage you to do that you think is a good idea? No matter what you think it is? <laughs> If you knew that you were going to be tested by the devil, it would just be a no matter what he says, no. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It would be good for me. So we're going to say no because of the source. So, you don't know what's underlying. So let's... Yeah. Let, yeah. He's the father of lies. So no matter what, he wants right. death and destruction. Yeah, so there's no, di- there's no doubt he knows Jesus and Jesus knows him. And look at the setting. Sentence one says, He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What does sentence 2 say? How many of you think it would be a good idea to fast for 40 days and 40 nights? Science tells you you'd be dead. You'd be dead long before the 40 days. Yeah. So you got to understand the setting in order to understand why when the devil comes to him and says, just turn these stones into bread. What's the big deal? Otherwise, it would be difficult to understand why Jesus gives the response he gives. So one of the lessons is don't take things out of their context and try to digest them. That's not a good idea. It's not okay to box up parts of the message into little packages and ignore the rest of the bulk of the message. Because we can miss the context of the message. Okay? And the only way we can understand that this is... Jesus would have recognized that the devil was the one tempting him was because... Who was the one who led him in this, into the wilderness to begin with? Holy the Holy Spirit. Who would have to be tending to him for 40 days and 40 nights for him to be able to even answer the devil? Holy <laughs> okay? So if he's led you there and he has instructed you as to what to do, why would you suddenly stop listening to him? There's only bad news for the answer if you choose to stop listening to him. There's no good news. So, this is Jesus demonstrating that even in what seems to be an innocuous or uh, meaningless statement from the devil, you always have to be on guard against him for everything. Never trust him. Never think he's on your side. Never think he's actually even in a condition where he's giving you something that doesn't matter. Instead, always be seeking to listen to whom and follow whom. The Holy Spirit's the answer. That's right. That's exactly correct. So that's the essence of the answer then. It's saying the temptation is making Mm-hmm. coming from the devil and that's his response mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's necessary but abiding in the word of God is more important than listening to you correct no matter what you're going to say even if it's something absolutely necessary like bread that might be just that's right no matter what you're going to say more important 
is to hear the word of God and follow him rather than anything else. But this is also a passage that shows the ignorance of the devil. This is a passage that demonstrates the devil is not equal with God in knowledge. What does he say to Jesus to tempt him? doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't recognize him. It almost seems that way, doesn't it? But it's the devil's not looking for a sign. This is a simply overlooked passage by most people because of so much false teaching that's out there. And only when you understand the truth will this part of the passage make sense. What would Jesus have to do in order to turn the stones into bread? So he would have to ask on his own apart from the Holy Spirit he cannot turn those stones into bread that's an important thing to understand why is that important? because so many people think that Jesus while he walked on the earth had all of the divinity of God that's not true how did he get into the wilderness? led him there Just to start with, God starts off in the narrative telling us that Jesus had to follow the Holy Spirit. If he is in this capacity at this time fully God, he's not following the Holy Spirit, he's equal to the Holy Spirit. He knows everything the Holy Spirit knows. So just by saying he was led by the Holy Spirit is an indication that there is a need on his part to subject himself to the Holy Spirit and follow the Holy Spirit. And that's that's because God reveals that in order for Jesus to become man, he had to empty himself for a time of his divinity and become man. What is Jesus' answer to the devil? Man shall not live by bread alone. He doesn't say to him, look, I'm God in every way. I could do it if I want to, but... Right? You see, these are the nuances that are in the exchange that reveal some pretty big things. Jesus is acknowledging in his current state he is just a man dependent upon the Holy Spirit just like you and I are. And he's going to choose to continue to trust the Holy Spirit and not deviate from that trust and give it over to the devil. Here's another reason why this is really, really important. When you get around to reading the book of Romans and the Holy Spirit's revealing to us that the first Adam sinned and brought all of mankind under the bondage of sin and the wrath of God, the last Adam, Jesus, refused that sin and rescued us. This is the temptation that, the, that Satan gave in the Garden of Eden to Adam to subject himself instead of to God, to Satan. And because he did, all of us, being in the loins of Adam we're subject to the consequence of that sin. And only by the fact that someone just like us, Jesus, God, limiting himself to being a man in that form for a time, has to be just like us to rescue us. And what he's doing is showing us how we can live in resistance to to Satan and sin and in faithfulness to him, no matter what the situation, because I promise you, you will never be in a more dire situation than having fasted 40 days and 40 nights and being supported by God himself. There's not another situation. And oh, by the way, he doesn't do it and still make him so that he's not hungry or thirsty, because what does he say? And after the 40 days and 40 nights, he was what? Hungry. 
Hungry. Hungry. So he didn't eliminate the things that we are subject to to take care of him. He makes him go through the exact same things we would go through. And it's a test. It's a test as to whether or not Jesus will in fact trust his Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit working in his life. This is how we can understand he can rightly be our example. If we understand it in any other context, if we think that Jesus was fully divine at this time and without the aid of Father and Holy Spirit, but on his own, could have turned these stones into bread, he can't be our example because you and I can't do that. You can only follow an example and become like them if you have the capacity to do what they do. If you never could have that capacity, it's a foolish errand to think that you can follow them to become like them. If it was a, you know, in our fantasy world, the superheroes, following Superman around doesn't mean I can fly. <clears throat> okay? So, same kind of context applies here. Just because people follow Jesus around, if he was always fully God in the flesh then we'd have a problem because we can never be that. And thinking he could actually be our example would be silly. Because finally, if he's fully God, God cannot sin, God cannot lie, and therefore he would have no ability to be judged in the same way we are judged. However, the Lord tells us that Jesus was tempted just as we are tempted and resisted those temptations. We are told that Jesus had to learn obedience. When does God have to learn anything? We're told Jesus had to grow in wisdom, knowledge, grace, and favor with God. Since when does God have to grow in favor with himself? Or how can God become more wise or knowledgeable or more gracious than he already is? You see, Jesus, to become Jesus, had to empty himself of his divinity to become just like you and I as man. And this is a great story about the dedication someone can have to God and defeat the enemy in their life. That's what makes this story so powerful. Because in this, at this time, he's just like you and I in the flesh. The only thing that would possibly make him different is he in, is 100% faithful to his Father and the Holy Spirit, and if we are anything less, that what is what would make us different. Does that make sense so far? So, then Satan says, okay, you want to rest on what it says in the Scriptures? I know what the Scriptures say too. So temptation number two, he takes him up on top of a high place in the temple and says, throw yourself down. Says that he's going to make sure the angels take care of you. It's written that way. And since you want to rest on what it's written, go do it. Another reason why we have to be very, very careful not to rip things out of context. Jesus' response is, yes, but it's also written that you shall not and our translations say tempt, the word can also be translated test. I think, I think tempt is a very poor choice word. It's only poor choice because of how it's currently used. I, I grew up thinking that that meant Jesus just saying, you can't, you shouldn't, you're not allowed to tempt me because I'm God. Yeah, I know. That's how I grew up thinking it meant. Well, that's why I take the I time right. to tell you what tempt means in this case is test. It always seemed like a cop out. When you just say that every so, time in movies or other situations, if you've ever heard somebody says, well, if I'm wrong, God can strike me dead with a lightning bolt. That's the kind of thing that is uh, specifically covered by what Jesus is talking here, not to put the Lord our God to the test. By the way, it would be a bad outcome if you decided to listen to that person normally. <laughs> so, we are not to test 
the Lord our God. So he has said certain things so we don't go in and purposefully put ourselves in a position where he would have to rescue us to test him and to see if he's there. Because that is, by definition in our actions, us indicating that we don't trust him. And then finally, Satan takes him up onto the top of the mountaintops and said, bow down to me and worship me and I'll give you all of this, essentially, right? So why is he able to do that? Why do you think it would be a temptation to Jesus? Yes. Because it already worked with Adam. Why wouldn't it work again? By the way, don't forget it's worked with many people since Adam up until Jesus. We can look at the stories in the Bible of Pharaoh, of Caesar. It's worked more than once. Your understanding was thinking that he's fully God and not just man. That's why the confusion exists. You've been told many times that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. And in and of itself, that statement has to be qualified. But at the time when he was incarnated into the womb of Mary, up and until the moment he died on the cross, he was purely man. He had shed himself of his divinity. The word in the Bible is when it says he made himself a little lower than the angels for a while. The word is metamorphosed, like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. He made himself something else. And the Bible says he emptied himself in order to do it. These are very rarely taught matters which bring confusion. Who wants to bring confusion more than anybody else? Satan. Satan, the same one that's tempting Jesus here. So the reason these temptations are valid is because Jesus is a man just like you and I. Because the scriptures also declare that God cannot be tempted as man is. So if that in fact is true and God is the one making the statement that he cannot be tempted... Why would he turn around if, he, if Jesus was fully God saying, and I went into the wilderness so that, the, so that Satan could tempt me? That sounds just a little contradictory, doesn't it? So Jesus being man at this point and not divine, not fully God, is in fact tempted. And the only reason that Satan can make such a claim as he does in the third place is because this is what he was given by Adam when Adam bowed down to him. You see, back in the original parts of Genesis, God gave dominion to the entire earth to Adam. Dominion means to rule over something. And Adam, when he took the fruit bowed down to Satan gave it to him Jesus has come to take it back and that's why he says away with you Satan it's the same statement get behind me Satan so when he says this to Peter a little bit later you'll see that this is the precisely same statement you shall worship Yehovah your God and him only you shall serve. Those are very important statements. He is not saying this is only applies to Satan. <laughs> By the way, this applies to all of God's creation. All of his creation worships him. All of his creation is purposed to serve only him. Not it, him or herself. 
and not anyone else or anything else. So if people wonder about what is my purpose, he just told you right there. What's your purpose? Worship and serve him only. That's your purpose. That's why you breathe. So when I teach people to read their Bibles, question number one is how do I hear from God about what he's revealing to me about himself in this passage? And the second question is what is he telling me about his call upon my life? What does he want from me? He wants me to not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. He wants me to not put him to the test, and he wants me to worship and serve him alone. Those are three real simple answers from what I can get from this about question number two. So what do I get from question number one? What do I perceive about the person and character of God from these passages? Or overcoming. Escape there is overcoming. One way or the other, yes, to, to be able to stand against it. Mm-hmm. And that Jesus is exemplifying that for us there. Not by going, oh, I'm really strong and I'm not going to fall into that. But going, this is the word of God. And that we use that. And that that's the way of escape for us. And the way to overcome is to use what he gave us. He gave us the tool to overcome all those things. So what if you don't know the word of God? Now what do you do? How important is it according to this passage for us to learn the Word of God? Super important. I mean, the devil can use it against us. Yeah. Okay? Why is it even more important than just the devil's going to use it against us? God wants it. Reread Jesus' first response. <laughs> you want to live? What does Jesus say is the way you live? Period. So, if you're concerned about continuing to live, that's how important it should be to you. The reason you live is because God spoke you into existence as He did everything else. And the reason you continue to live is because He declares it to be so. Why is it your heart did not stop beating last night while you were unconscious? Because you were plugged into your your charger. Sadie said it's because she didn't sleep. Because Sadie didn't <laughs> sleep, yeah. <laughs> not for very long, anyway. No, but it's not like it's any different while we're awake. We're not going, yeah, keep going hard, keep going. We don't control that. Yeah. What do you think makes your mind function? We don't know. We do know. We know that it's <laughs> Exactly correct. But these are the things that God talks about that He makes work. And He's telling us very clearly here we're in a test phase. And we're being tested as to whether we want to live or die. And that test is borne out by whether or not we pay any attention to His Word or not. And according to Jesus, the way we live by paying close attention to his word. So what's the secret to life? (laughs) The word of God, he tells us here, right? And it's also not just knowing it. Because clearly the devil knows it. That's exactly right. So there's got to be more to it there. So that's the point. Still still verse 4, live by. Not just know it, but actually live by. That's exactly right. Live by His Word, don't put Him to the test, and worship and serve only Him. Now you have three more ingredients to your Gospel. So Elizabeth and Tyler, what you don't know is when we started the uh, study in the Gospel of Matthew here, I told everybody, I said, what I want you to do is I want you to write down what you think the Gospel is. And then we're going to go through this study and we're going to figure out what parts are missing. 
from what you think the gospel is. Is this Venus or yours? Mine. You can may use I it. A pen? Yes, ma'am. Of course you may. And so you now have three more ingredients to your construction of the true gospel. That's why this is not unimportant. It's the difference between life and death. And you're exactly correct. If you don't know the Word of God and now you've heard this message, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to become hungry and thirsty for His Word or you're going to decide you don't care. Which means you don't believe and you'll just go on your own way. There's only one of those two responses. How you will go about learning can be decided upon after you make the decision, but you first have to make the decision. With the way that the Holy Spirit is providing for Jesus here, do you think if anyone makes the decision that they're going to purpose to hunger and thirst for Him, that He won't provide Himself for them? Look how he's being tended to over this course. Forty days and forty nights, no eating and no drinking, and he's still alive. He's being tended to. Some of us, some of us like snackery after a few minutes. <laughs> and if it's sweets, I don't think I ever fill up. <laughs> <laughs> so now listen to the next segment and see the, oh, go ahead Alex I have one, one to point out yep, yep. an interesting correlation between the three temptations that we went through um, in 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 it says do not love the world or the world if anyone loves the world the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but he is of the world. And that those three things that he says comprise what is in the world are, are those three temptations that Jesus was given. The lust of the flesh was bread, because he was hungry and he wanted to eat. The lust of uh, the eyes was seeing the whole world and being offered that. And the pride of life was to cast himself down and believe that God was going to take care of him. Right. That he was tested in every way that was... That, that comprises all the temptations of the earth and the flesh. Right. Anything else on those first passages before we move on? Okay, so then we're back into Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. And even though this is a different period of time in the sequence of our chronological events, it is purposed to be written this way so that you understand how it relates back to the things we just studied. Verse 12, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time... Jesus began to preach and to say, it doesn't matter how you live, just believe in me. That's not, true. not true, that's correct. Began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How does this 
section of the scriptures refer back to the previous section that we just read? Apart from Jesus is the main character in both sections. It's exactly the right answer. Because the three things that God reveals to us that we should be about in our lives, God already knows that we have previously not been good at these things. He knows that some of us have really sucked at it. And He says, I'm coming to destroy you, so put your head between your knees and kiss your fanny goodbye. No, He calls you to repentance so that he can rescue you. He says, look, I already know your condition. But you don't have to be like that anymore. And the reason it's so important is life and death matters more for the kingdom of heaven than it does for the kingdom of earth. If you haven't seen this before, I'll remind you. These are math symbols. That symbol is called a line. The reason there's an arrow at each end is it means there's no stoppage of time ever. It goes on infinity before and infinity past. Most people view themselves as a line segment. They have a beginning, they have an end, and all that matters is between these two points. Here's how God sees you. This is how God really sees you. And this is earth. And this is eternity. You have a very brief amount of time living here on earth. And that time sets the stage for what you will be in eternity. Now, this big long part of what's called a ray, a ray is something with an end point and an arrow at the other end. The reason the arrow is there is it never stops. You have one of two choices for the eternity. Choice number one is life. Choice number two is the eternal lake of fire. Those are our two choices. And what Jesus is pointing out to us here is there are specific things that God does in fact require in order for us to get the blue life. The way we forfeit that opportunity is by not listening to Him. And then we automatically get the only other alternative, the eternal lake of fire where torment never ends. So what He's demonstrating here is one of His character types that God is love. He's also, de- he's also demonstrating a great goodness and a great severity of his character. The goodness is, I don't want to destroy you. I want to rescue you. I want you to be with me. Look how far I'm going to go to try to help you be with me. But at the end, if you really don't want to listen to me, which means you don't want to be with me, I'll let you go. And you'll end up in the eternal lake of fire in eternal torment. And that's the severity side. This is something he specifically speaks about in Romans chapter 11. The goodness and the severity of God. Or if you read 
Psalm chapter 1, that's exactly what the psalm says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but he delights in the law or word of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like the tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring forth fruit in its season and whose leaf shall not wither. But the ungodly are not so. For they will not be able to stand in the congregation with the righteous. They'll be gathered up like the chaff and thrown into the fire. I mean, he says this over and over and over again. So what he is demonstrating here is an incredible love that he has for people who have been in the past either outright rejecting him or just ambivalent to his existence. Didn't care that he was there. Paid no attention. And he's coming to get their attention to tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Your time could be any second, any moment. And we must be understanding that when we are done in this domain the judgment for the next domain has to do with the things he just said to us did you care at all about being with me did you care at all about the things that I said did you worship and serve me or someone or something else that's why these passages are so interconnected and so important goes on to say in verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and, uh, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Now, let me ask you a question. What would you say is the most popular short message given by most so-called preachers or evangelists. If you had to say it in a small nutshell, what would you say is the most popular message that they want you to know? Okay. That's something that's important, but most of them don't say that. The question is, what is the most popular message that you can think of that's out there. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's one of them. <laughs> what's the What's the message that Billy Graham told everybody? Three words. Jesus loves you. By far the most popular message told by the most prominent of so-called Bible teachers, preachers, and evangelists. Have we heard that here yet? Have, has Jesus gone around saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Is that his message? So, what, did we, what were we told his message was that says, from that time... Jesus began to preach and to say what? Repent. <laughs> yes. It normally seems a friendly thing. Yeah. It indicates you've done something wrong. Do 
we have any reason to think that all these people he's preaching to would have received any other message? Because it says from that time, which is an indication meaning from that time forward, this is what he did. Certainly he spoke other words, but what's recorded for us to know is that he said repent. The primary substrate of all the messages are repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here's the next thing. How many of you have been taught that the gospel came after Jesus rose from the dead? Because after all, he had to die and rise again for us to have the gospel, right? That's a common misunderstanding. What does it say Jesus taught around Galilee in verse 23? And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching what? How did he know what the gospel was? He wasn't dead and rose up from the dead again. Very interesting, huh? If Jesus isn't dead and risen from the dead and now knows what the gospel is to have everybody else go out and share, that's not what it took. How did Jesus know what the gospel was already? That's right. That's exactly correct. The gospel, the promises of God are contained in the scriptures and the gospel is built on God's promises. Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises. He is not showing up and God's now giving us something for the first time. The reason Jesus can proclaim the gospel is because the gospel has already been known for hundreds or thousands of years. Jesus has come to fulfill the gospel, not to initiate it. And the people that he was speaking to, there's quite a multitude of them. This is a lot of people he's describing. This is not taking place over a couple of minutes, even though we read it in seconds. Okay, you're talking about a significant period of time and a lot of work and ministry and teaching. There's this word in here, preaching. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is the kind of thing that we can skip right over if we don't understand. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching is proclaiming something to someone that they've heard for the first time. Teaching is going on to explain further and uh, demonstrate and train them how to do something or how to be something, how to know something, right? But preaching is like the herald standing on the corner, hey, you didn't know, but this is what happened and it's in the newspaper, buy our newspaper and you can learn about it, right? That's what essentially the preaching is. And so it's silly for people to stand up in front of a church speaking to the same people that come basically every weekend saying that those are preachers because then you've got to wonder have these guys had their earplugs in the whole time? How is it that what's being told to them is being told to them for the first time? Especially if that person is teaching them to do what Ann said earlier. Read their Bibles. Listen to the word of the Lord and follow Him. If that's being taught, these people should be discussing what they've already read You follow? They shouldn't be hearing these things for the first time. And only when that's happening would they then be able to distinguish between whether they're being lied to or told the truth. If you don't know the Word of God, how difficult is it for me to fool you? No, it's very easy, isn't it? But if you know something emphatically, then it's hard to tell you something that's not true and fool you. That's what the devil's counting on, you see. He's counting on your ignorance to the word of God so that he can fool you and deceive you in all sorts of things in all sorts of ways. This is why it's so important to apply ourselves to learning the word of the Lord more than anything else we would endeavor to do. It doesn't mean you don't have other pressures on life that you have to do. You have to work to earn a living, to be able to pay your bills, have food, shelter, clothing, right? You have to do that. But that doesn't take all of our time. 
what we do with the rest of our time is an indication of what we think about, whether it's important or not to desire to eat and drink from the word of the Lord and whether or not we care enough at all about a relationship with him. To listen to him, to follow him. To be concerned about worshiping him and serving him. And what will happen for eternity. And while he's doing this, chapter 5, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Most of the settings that teach this passage show the multitudes following him. What did God just tell us? Who was present with him on the mountain? His disciples. Now, we don't know how many this is, and we need to not fool ourselves that it was only Peter and Andrew and uh, James and John, because those are the only four named so far. So it wasn't just Jesus and the four. His disciples means those that are now hearing his message and following him. Not the people that are just coming into vicarious contact with him and ignoring him, and some of them receiving some of that benefit while they're around him. But these are people who've made the choice to follow him and listen to him. That's who his disciples are. And he has an opportunity to teach them. So why go up on the mountain? Why not just stay down in the cities? So it's a common setting we find in the scriptures. Why though? Solitude. It's also a a place that's typically free of the distractions. There's the answer. He's taken them to a place where he can get them aside and teach them and have a focus for that particular meeting, right? This is something we have to know we are going to have to do if we're going to hear him, receive from him, and learn from him. We can't do it if we're doing it as something else that's going on in the background while we're busy giving our attention elsewhere. Pretty hard to learn that way. We are finite creatures and only have a limited bandwidth. So, we have to decide to prioritize this for a time to be able to go listen to him and learn from him. Which means we have to say no to other things. That is why we're here. Once a week you're going to starve. Once a week we're going to starve. Yes, ma'am. How many healthy patients? How many healthy patients do you think you would see in the hospital when you were working there if they came in and you said, "Look, I eat and drink every Sunday morning. I don't understand why I'm losing so much weight." <laughs> So, the point he's making here is, most of us, and if you look at me, you can tell I don't skip very many meals, okay? So, the priority that I give my food for my body needs to not be the priority that I give to the food for my life. If I can make time to eat three meals a day, plus my desserts, and my aperitifs <laughs> and my snacks okay the point is I need to also be mature enough to make time to be in the word of the Lord it won't just happen and I will have to say no to other temptations of things that I might like to do and in and of themselves wouldn't necessarily be sinful like turning stones into bread But, who am I going to listen to? The Lord drawing me to be spending time with Him by ourselves or all of the distractions of the life of the things that I think I might want to do? And how I prioritize these things is an indication to Him and evidence to me as to how much value I put on this relationship. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These things are often taught and gone over by people who vastly misunderstand them and want to appeal to an audience so that they can keep coming and supporting their organization. I want to tell you what I think they mean so that you don't misunderstand. First of all, you can't understand this passage unless you understand chapter 4, verse 17. And what chapter 4, verse 17 is built on. Chapter 4, verse 17 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent from what? Not valuing the word of God the way it's supposed to be valued. Not worshiping and serving God alone. So what happens in people when they go about life not caring whether or not their lives are pleasing to the God that created and sustains them, they're not poor in spirit. They're haughty in spirit. They think they're good. They think they're okay. Looking at the real condition of who they are is not something they're interested in doing because it doesn't make them feel good. Jesus says, oh no, that feeling of grossness that you see about yourself he says that's a good thing because that's the opportunity to turn it around if you don't agree with that if you don't realize it he says what's the point what's going to motivate you to be any different you don't think there's any bad news there's no good news good news is only good because there is bad news when we were studying back in chapter 3 we talked about the bad news when John the Baptist says to the religious elites that came out to see him, brood of vipers who warned you to flee the wrath to come. There is a wrath that is coming. That's the bad news. The people who are poor in spirit are the ones who agree with God and say, you're right, I've been off track. You're right, I've not been worshiping you and serving you. And we humble ourselves that's what the poor in spirit is. But it doesn't leave you there. This is not a perpetual state. Because by giving yourselves, like we sang in the song today, by giving yourselves to the Lord, what does He do? Is He lifts you up into Christ. And He helps you to live a life of victory. Of joy. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Mourning over their condition and the condition of other people. Being true the way God describes it, not the way the people describe themselves. Again, not intended to be a perpetual state about ourselves. That should be a cause for an event of turning our lives unto the Lord through repentance and worship unto Him and believing the Gospel that we have in fact been rescued by Jesus which should produce a life that would never go back to the old life. Yeah, if you actually get comforted then you're not mourning anymore. Correct. Otherwise you weren't comforted. Yes, otherwise there's comfort's false. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth or the land. Meek is not a term we use frequently, so if you want to write a little note to yourself, meek means gentle. Does not mean weak. Means gentle. And this is talking about a general condition of your behavior in gentleness. There are times when gentleness is not the call. Elizabeth, when your horse is being ornery, are you always gentle? No. You then have to motivate your horse to change its mind, don't you? Okay? You find Jesus does the same things. I just read to you what John the Baptist did. Brood of vipers. Who told you to... He said it really gently. Look, I want you guys to know that I love you. So don't be offended by the names I'm going to call you. No. There is a time to be direct. There is a time to be angry. But do not sin. Jesus is good and angry a number of times. Three times actually. And using a whip to drive people away so he could do it. Opened the cages and let the animals loose that were being used as extortion for the people. Oh yeah. <laughs> Telling the religious elitists that they were hypocrites and sons of the devil. How do you do that nicely? <laughs> so, but as a general course of life, until there is a reason not to be gentle, gentle be gentle. But when there is a reason not to be gentle, take the steps you need to take. Like the way he treated the woman at the well. Like the way he treated the woman at the well. Yeah. That's right. Just direct, gentle. Gentle. Or the way he treated the woman caught in adultery. Yeah. And there's a number of examples of how he was gentle, but certainly to those who were resistant or rebellious against him, he stopped being gentle. And when you remember what we just studied having finished the book of Revelation, as he comes back, the people who are rebellious, not real gentle. Read the descriptions. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You see how this directly relates to the word of the Lord. To hunger and thirst for his word. Okay, Anthony, yesterday you learned from the second epistle of Peter how you would know if you in fact have tasted the Lord is gracious. What is the response for those who in fact have tasted the Lord is gracious? For? To crave the Word of God like a baby craves mother's milk, according to God. That's the evidence that we have in fact tasted the Lord is gracious. That's what he says. And then, having been awakened this way as an adult, we still have a choice to make. A baby doesn't know how to make choices yet. It's hungry, it cries. Right? He or she cries. That's the way it works. As an adult, we simply say, oh, I'll find something else to eat. That's what we do, unless we're faithful. To hunger and thirst for something specific. How many of us have gone looking for something to eat in our home, couldn't find it, and ran to the store to go get it? Every one of us in here, raise your hand, because you know you've done it. Okay? <laughs> it's happened. All right? Was there other stuff in the home to eat? Yep. But that's not what we wanted. That's an understanding of what he's talking about here. You want something so much that nothing else in the house will do. This is the only thing that will satisfy you. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Plenty of other options. There's all sorts of things. Well, there's also just distractions. There's, whether it's television or Instagram or computer video games or I'm just a gazillion things. Right? Just chit-chatting with friends. 
in and of itself is not a bad thing, but in the context of that's how I spend the bulk of my time and none with the Lord, now I've got a problem. And my friends aren't the problem. My choosing is a problem. My personal responsibility and self-control are a problem. Look what he promises here. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness might be fed. I might visit them. This is a guarantee. The Lord says, if you hunger and thirst for him, for his righteousness, his word, he will guarantee to fill you. You know how many times I've had people give me the excuses of, I can't read, I can't understand, I can't retain, I can't this, I can't the other, I can't the other, I can't the other, I can't the other. My answer to them is, can't, never accomplished anything. Let me ask you a question. How weak is God? Because He's the one making the guarantee, not you. So if God's the one making the guarantee, your part is the hunger and thirst, which means feed. His part is He guarantees to fill you. Let Him do His part. Just focus on your part. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He's talking to a crowd of people that by and large are not merciful. Remember his original message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Stop being unmerciful. Start being merciful to one another. Because guess what he is demonstrating by the fact that he even exists in the flesh. Much less how he's going to finish off his time on earth is by providing the mercy of the Lord through His grace, to grant us a second kick at the can. Because without Jesus doing that, we all get what's up there in red and have no choice, have no hope. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Don't be someone who rests on nobody's perfect. Eliminate that from your thinking. First of all, who thinks Jesus was perfect? Hopefully every one of you. So one man was perfect. His name is Jesus. And according to Jesus, if we let him train us, he says he can make us like him. So, to have a pure heart. If I was to take your cup, what were you drinking, Tyler? Coffee. Coffee. If I was to take your coffee and have you make another cup and make it just the way you like it, but right before you started drinking it, I put just one drop of cyanide in it and stirred it in. And I handed it to you. Would you drink it? No. Why not? Um, logically, you wouldn't want to drink cyanide. Logically, you wouldn't want to. Why not? Um, a uh, very uh, toxic chemical. Correct. It's a very toxic chemical, and it will be the difference between whether you live or die. Right. So is the purity of our hearts. Who in their right minds would think, based on what you've just heard today from God, that if we turned our lives over to Him and then we went out and continued to contaminate our hearts, He'd be okay with it? No, of course not. (laughs) Of course not. And the reality is, the next thing that's taught is, well, nobody's perfect, so Jesus just keeps cleansing your heart with all the sin that you keep doing. He just keeps washing you. Is that what you've heard from him so far? You have to repent. You have to trust him. Even when you're in the wilderness, even when you're hungry, even when the things that your flesh wants, his word must be more important to you. If you get nothing else about the character of God through all of this, 
He is very demanding. He's not playing around. He's not a pushover. There is no negotiation. He is indicating to us what the rules are. And this is one of the things that makes him a just God. He's told us in advance what the requirements are. We choose to listen or we don't. We choose to obey or we don't. But these requirements are the basis for his judgment. He's not going to just make it up when we get there. He's not going to go, oh gosh, Sadie, you're just particularly cute, so I'm going to let you in. He's not going to have mercy on you because you're particularly ugly, stinky, short. None of that's going to matter. His requirements have been given to us so that we can know. What relationship do you think you could have of a close relationship that would be any other way? Name a close relationship you have with anyone. You have no idea what the requirements of the relationship are and you just kind of feel your way through it hoping you don't step on a landmine. Blow yourself up. Not a close relationship, Not a close relationship no. by definition, right? Right? Correct. So, even though sometimes we feel a certain way, we may not do it because we know that breaks the rules of the relationship. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Human beings, without a reason to have limitations, we wouldn't have any. So as men, why wouldn't we have sex with every woman we met? If there's not a reason to have those limitations, why wouldn't we? Look, if you look at the animal kingdom, that's what happens. One of the things that makes us different is we have a reason not to do that. And when I usually say things like this, somebody's wife or girlfriend sitting next to him says, yeah, otherwise I'd kill you. Right? That's not a big enough reason most of the time because that's why rampant illicit, illicit sexual activity goes on. The reason is, if we don't understand these subjects in the light of God's word, we will not be pure in heart. And the consequence then is we get the red instead of the blue. We get eternal like a fire instead of eternal life. And so there are reasons that can only be explained by a greater cause. If evolution is true, then there is no reason, and I get to have as many women as I want, take as much stuff as I want because there's no basis for right and wrong. And the only way I get beat is somebody's bigger, more powerful, stronger, or kills me first. Because those would be the only rules. Pureness in heart is something that we have to purpose to have. We have to be intentional about. So that when the enemy fires those darts of temptation in our way, we have to reject them with the shield of faith. We can't stop him from throwing the darts in, but we can certainly put him out very quickly without entertaining him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Most people, when they teach this, think of this in a horizontal sense. They think about, let's be peaceable with one another. Let's not be angry with one another. This statement although it has that as part of its application, it's not its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is all of us, apart from believing and living the gospel, are dead in our trespasses and sins and have made ourselves enemies of God. We need to make peace with God. And so peacemakers are people who come alongside someone else and say, let me help you make peace with God. 
and live in that peace. And if everybody in the world did that, we would have no conflict with one another. It'd be automatically solved. You know, and truly have peace with another person if you're both abiding by the same rule set. It's correct. You have to both abide by the same rule set to have peace with one another. It's exactly correct. And if everybody had peace with God, we'd have one rule set that everybody would abide in and everybody would get along. We wouldn't have to be trying to be peaceful with other people. Be automatic. Be an automatic outflow. That would be the fruit of our life. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Persecution all by itself does not mean that we've been persecuted for righteousness' sake. I can tell you that I go down when I visit my friend Terry in California and we go down to the prison ministry. There are lots of people in there that believe they're being persecuted. Sure. Complain to you about how innocent they are. And even if they're guilty, that they're being persecuted too much for their crime. Correct. And then the degree is not agreeable to them. That's right. So just because somebody perceives themselves being persecuted is not the answer. We must know that we're doing righteousness. How is the only way we can know that what we're doing is righteous? It's the only way. Period. you got to compare it to what the Word of God says. It's the only way you can know right from wrong, good from evil. The one who sets the standard. And then he expounds upon that a little bit more, saying, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The prophets were the ones who came forward to the people when they were not abiding in Christ. The prophets would come and tell them this is where you're broken. This is what to do to repent. Do it quickly because the kingdom of heaven is at hand and time's running out. The people so didn't like that message, they killed them. The prophets then went into the presence of God and the people that killed them were bound for the eternal lake of fire. So he's telling us we have to be willing to do this to the exception of all the rest of the culture around us. We have to be willing to listen to him and follow him no matter if anyone else agrees with us or not. Now you can understand some of the statements I made to you yesterday. People have come to me over the years and said all sorts of things to me about how wrong they thought I was. I'd simply say to them, show me where the scriptures support your accusation and you have my attention. You see, because any kind of an accusation that you've done something wrong should also be found in the same set of rules, right? Right? If what is good is there, what is evil is there. What if what is right is there, then what is wrong is explained in the same way. So there's no question we can understand and know whether we are walking in righteousness or not by the Word of God. This is why it's so important to know His Word. So critical. And if we abide in His Word, we'll have the peace, we'll have the joy. We won't mourn over our own condition. We may mourn over the condition of people we love who refuse to listen. And we can have peace with God. The critical component to all of this is what? In summary, what would you say is the critical message through all of this? 
There may be a you know, dozen things you would list, but what's at the top of your list? That's not a rhetorical question. Your what? Okay, that's at the top of your list. Your willingness to submit yourself to the Word of God. What's at the top of the rest of your lists? You said that, by the way, like that's a question. This is your list. You've heard God speak to you just like I did this morning. The question is, what's at the top of your list? And if I've written a list, it's no longer a question. It's an answer. Live by his word, worship and serve only him. That's at the top of her list. What's at the top of your list? Huh? Yeah. Anybody got anything else at the top of the list? Something different? She's got it on the nail, right? She hit the nail on the head. Live by his word, worship and serve only him. That should be at the top of your list. That should be at the top of list for life for you. And anything else won't make it. The good news is God's given us the ability, the provision, and all of the help from Him that we need to be able to do that. We have no excuse if we don't. Other than we just didn't want to. It just wasn't important to us. It's supposed to be people who make it important whether we're at the beginning, the middle, or toward the end. Some of us are a little more toward the end than others. I am. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's important. Yeah. The point is, no matter what stage, it doesn't change. It's not different for anyone along that way. This is something that never changes for anyone that wants to live. Let's go people that be people that live.